is high drama head over heels with the plays we saw. I just, me and Bina went to see Head Over Heels and I cannot review it because I cannot stand the Go-Go's. I happen to be friends with Margo Oliveira and she started the Go-Go's. It wouldn't even be Go-Go's if it weren't for her, but they summarily kicked her out for the most heinous, revolting reasons. And I don't care if this is not, this is just the music of the Go-Go's. It doesn't matter. They are vile, despicable people and I loathe them. So I can't give them a fair review. So here's Bina. This silly, stupid, uninvolving, silly, silly, silly show called Head Over Heels, which was, you know, uh, written originally by Sir, Sir Philip Sidney, adapted by Jeff Vitti, and, uh, uh, no, written by Jeff Vitti and adapted by James, James Magruder. This show is so confusing, even the names of the characters so confusing, the main character is Mussy Doris. And he turns into a woman with very ugly looking Amazon type woman. When everybody in Arcadia, which is not uh, to Tom Stoppers, if it was by Sir Philip Sidney, everybody is attracted towards him except me. <laughs> <laughs> it was like so bad. And the music, it just doesn't go with it. And they're trying to attract us towards this thing and we are just so tortured. I have never seen such a bad show in my life and I was never influenced by Eva because she did not tell me anything. And this is this is like actually instead of enjoying the show which I tried few times because of course I'm at the theater I want to enjoy a little bit. Oh my god it was so disgusting. Very unhappy face. Renee Taylor's one-woman show, My Life on a Diet, is an absolutely adorable, laugh-out-loud, funny slice of both a woman's struggle in Hollywood dieting and her Hollywood career. It's very, very interesting as she talks all about breaking into show business on late-night TV, The Jack Parr Show, and then how she basically became a comedian and then eventually quite an accomplished playwright and actress collaborating with her late husband Joseph Bologna. So she Which she which even on this, this that he posthumously worked on that's it. That's right. You know. That's right. And um, so so it, it is a one woman show set in a golden leopard decorated boudoir. And she's a woman. She's quite a woman quite uh, I think she's like eighty five or something. Uh, she's in her eighties. In her eighties and she's just as glamorous with her piled up hair and her sparkling jewels and her lipstick. I like what you said in the, in the written review that she looked like Barbara Cartland. Uh, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's what exactly. I thought. Like candy colored, puffed up hair and just a grand dame with a good old broad sense of humor. And someone with that many itises can still command a stage and our undivided attention. And I'd forgotten she played Eva Brown in Springtime for Hitler and the Producers oh. with Dick Sean, which I'd completely forgotten about. And she may have gone through many transformations on various diets, but she never lost her comic appeal. As she put it, she is a food tramp. That is someone who eats around. The show my, uh, right, has rightly been extended, and afterwards you can get the book the show is based on and take it home and in reading it, still hear her inimitable voice in your head and keep on laughing. I never stop laughing. I mean, she even has Marilyn Monroe's diet. Yes. With, with te the telemarketer. This break. is, she would, she would um, ask advice from everybody that she met what their diets were. So this was Marilyn Monroe's diet. Breakfast, grapes. Lunch, grapes. Dinner, frozen grapes. And when Renee tried this diet and went back to Marilyn and said, hey Marilyn, I'm not sure about this diet. I gained 10 pounds on it. Marilyn said, oh gee, you must have eaten 10 pounds of grapes. <laughs> Which I think she did. <laughs> so I really, the, you will have the best time yes. ever. I tell you, I truly, I, I've never been to a show where I never stop laughing, not once. Agreed. Not once. Agreed. She, and you all know her, of course, from, uh, from uh, my, my nanny. That's right, the nanny. She played the mom on the nanny. Hysterical and delightful. We're stopping high drama for a moment to talk with Leslie DeLeo, as Leslie DeLeo, who is going to be King Herod, in Salome. Now tell us about this version of Salome. Well, this version of Salome by um, Black Orchid Theater, directed by Craig Hutchison, is called Salome Reversed, because Craig got the idea to take Oscar Wilde's uh, script Salome and change three of the characters. He said, we're so used to the story of a dirty old man 
um, bribing a young girl, it, but in this case, it's now going to be a dirty old woman lusting after a young man. So I'm going to play the King Herod role, Claudia Terry is going to play the um, prophet role, John the Baptist, and um, Jorge Ortiz is going to play the sa uh, male Salome. So we're in rehearsal now, it opens next weekend, so we're, it's very interesting working on these role reversals. And um, the last time we did this, four years ago, one person who happened to be a priest commented, it's very creepy. <laughs> so apparently the role reversals worked, and of course in the era of Me Too, we know that it's not just men that can yeah, be that, sexual just predators. Yeah, just in the news now that... Us, that, that, uh, Asia that, that Asia Argenta, yeah. With, with the Bennett kid. That's yeah. exactly right. So it's really quite, quite topical, and hopefully we'll be asked to... Um, bring this play up to the Theater Association of New York State's festival in November. So that's why we're relaunching it. Ooh. Yes, so we're look, really looking forward to it. And, is um, Kristen Hardwick doing those stage shows? Kristen action? Hardwick is actually in the show. She plays my head servant. Oh! So she's in it. <gasps> but she's if you're show. King Harold, that doesn't mean you can, like, can't wear your glitter eye makeup. Oh, <laughs> believe me, I'm actually queen. I'll be wearing. I'll mm. be wearing that. Even though Craig said not to, I'll be wearing it. <laughs> I know that the struggle <laughs> between you and Craig. And I Quinn. know <laughs> that's true. You know, you should do candy so you can see glitter and be gay. <laughs> oh my God, that would be fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, go see Salome. Tell them the date. It's um, Labor Day weekend, so if you're not um, out in the Hamptons or the, hanging and this out, is, this show is on September first. That's right. It starts um, next Friday, August thirty first at eight p.m. Saturday, September first at eight p.m. Sunday, September 2nd at 3 p.m. Um, uh, at Resurrection Church, 117 East 74th Street. So if you want to know what High Drama is up to, they're all busy acting. It's got the same place like they should be seen. But then I'm not seeing them either because it's a summer. I Love Shoals Productions presents Alex and Eugene, a new musical with book music and lyrics by Brian Williams, directed by Justy Kosek, choreography by Alex Johnson, and it concerns a group of recent theater arts graduates trying to make it in New York City. Eugene is an outgoing actor who befriends the show's narrator, Alex, an introvert wannabe writer who's working on a musical of Pushkin's Eugene Onegin. There's also Alex's twin sister, Tanya. Uh, there's who is, doesn't look anything like him. That's what she says all the time. Right. And there's a, a friend, Janie, who's in love with the gay guy, Brandon. There's a political activist, Cassandra. And a latecomer to the group, Esme, who um, gets Alex smitten with her, but later it turns out she's much more in love with herself and fame. And when Eugene gets a chance to be discovered by an agent, this will throw a monkey wrench in the group's dynamics and what will happen. Now, I don't know anything about Eugene. i just seen Pushkin, so I was interested in seeing this because it was based on... A, 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 a little bit. But, but, but you know, uh, it was straightforward and very clear, so you don't need to know Eugene on again. It, it was just your typical Russian plot of misguided people in love with the wrong people and suffering for it. And this worked very well in a theater group situation because you're always in such close proximity and there's always, you know, theater romances going on. And I just want to point out that uh, Joseph Mace, he plays all these different characters. He had this incredible voice. I mean, they all had gorgeous voices, but his voice was just, just so rich. I could listen to a whole CD of his voices, but the acting was all phenomenal. Yeah, I thought this was a really wonderful new musical. And as the show gets on, if you do know Eugene Onegin, there are more references to it. And that makes it even more interesting for people who love Pushkin. But even without it, you'll have a great time. It's a great theatrical musical. And there were a few, thea there were a few um, minor directorial flaws, but we saw it in preview, and I'm sure they fixed it. So and I... And even if they didn't, it doesn't matter. It's still wonderful. Yeah, so I'm giving it a happy face. So am I. Deborah Carpell is coming back to Panagea with her autobiographical show called The Midwood Miracle. She's giving a loving tribute to her roots and her early days of starting out as an actor in New York City, interspersed with relevant songs from Klezmer to Baptist hymns at Panagea, the Supper Club Cabaret Space. 
Her Jewish family is from New York City to Appalachia, and this heartwarming tale will leave you quelling for more. So definitely go see it. You've got a nice meal, a wonderful music, a really good story, and she just, the way she tra transforms to all the characters, I just adore her. I've known her since her improv days of Shock of the Funny. She is such a talent. I'm not sure if I <coughs> told you, she's coming back September 7th to Panagea. Irish Rep is reviving the show that made Barbara Harris a star. On a clear day, you could see forever. Music by Burton Lane, book and lyrics by Alan J. Lerner, adopted and directed by Charlotte Moore, and it features Daisy Gamble, played by Melissa Errico, who sees Dr. Mark Bruckner for hypnosis to stop smoking in the 1960s. It becomes apparent that she has unusual special abilities and strong memories of an earlier life in the 18th century. The doctor becomes fascinated by her earlier self. Will he ever really care about her contemporary persona? It's a very far-fetched plot, but the music is divine. Yeah, it's, um, it's, you know, she also has this ability to make plants grow, and she has ESP, and she can know when the phone's going to ring and who's going to be on the phone. She knows what you're thinking all the time. I mean, there's all these weird qualities to it, but it doesn't matter. It's just, <laughs> uh, it's got one of my favorite songs of all times in it, What Did I Have That I Don't Have Now, which is this heartbreaking song where she's like, you know, she sort of has a thing for the doctor, and then she realizes he's in love with her, but her previous me, you know, that, uh, you know and it was just so I mean it's a silly story but it's still so much fun and so good and when you got this top notch cast we saw Stephen Bogardus in the role but I think Ben West has taken oh. over I, I might have gotten the name wrong but I'm giving this a happy face and I just want to say we're so sad because Barbara Harris just died and she, she like like you said she was in the apple tree she was in Nashville she's the one that's saying it don't worry me so go see on a clear day and think about Barbara Harris yeah I gave it a happy face minus it's delightfully streamlined but it's still the, the book's a bit of a slog this is Jan Ewing's review of heist which book and lyrics by Alice Koseja, music by Michael Uselman, and choreography by Jenna Hames, Koseja, and Uselman. Heist is a hysterical tale about a group of thieves getting themselves cast in a Broadway musical in order to steal a valuable necklace has a lot going for it. First, it's consistently funny. Both the lyrics and the book provide laugh after laugh, poking fun at everything from politically correct social issues to actors' equity. The characters are a delight. They are all played by young actors well versed in the comedic art. The singing is mostly first rate, at times spectacular, and the dancing aided by clever choreography is a pleasure to watch. I think there is a bit too much music in the first act as expository. It introduces a lot of the storyline that causes some confusion because it's a complicated plot and some passages that are talky rather than melodic. But this can all be fixed very easily and he really enjoyed it a lot and he gives it a happy face. Natco is presenting Shakespeare's Henry VI, which is normally in three parts, but they've reduced it to two. Henry VI is the history play in between Henry V, which is the great warrior king who conquers France, and Richard III, the great villain. And here, the first part is mostly about international strife, where Joan of Arc is rallying the Dauphin and the French troops, causing havoc for the English, and towards the end, the Irish begin uh, acting up. The second part, which follows really the War of the Roses between the white Plantagenets and the Red Rose Lancasters, and it's a bloody mess for England. Yeah, um, I, I didn't even know this was Shakespeare. This was like this exciting history play, and I was just so drawn into this, and it, all the battles and, and the characters were so exciting, and the actors were incredible. I mean, Nia Caddick back is wonderful, and a lot of the women played male parts, and also, the thing is, uh, Queen Margaret was just 
really just a vicious, vicious, mm -hmm. bloodthirsty, and all Henry VI tried to do was bring peace. And everyone hated him because he kept trying to bring peace. You know, he lost the French territories because he wanted peace. He, he was losing the Irish territory. He was losing England. So everyone was attacking him for being peaceful. Well, and you, you know, say famous speech. There, there is the famous speech where he uh, laments his life as a king and wishes he were a shepherd. So temperamentally, he's not really suited to be the king, but. Um, you know, but everybody else is so horrible. He's one of the few sympathetic people. Mia Kadibak plays one of the few other ones. And I really like Joan of Arc here. And normally she's played, you know, as the one that all the English feel is the witch and is hateful. But she was cool. She was a ninja. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the fight scenes were great. Yeah. I mean, this was just so brilliantly done. This yeah, was it's a superb production. I mean, and we saw it all in one day. We saw part mm -hmm. the part one and part two, so we saw we, we had spent six hours at the theater watching this. And I got to tell you, it was fabulous. And I am so not theater-minded right now, but my gosh, this is just... It's ooh. totally exhilarating. You know, like, it's great to see it in one day. Rahanna Ramoon Maharaj is presenting her play with music, Little Rock, at the Sheen. It covers the period from September 4, 1957 to May 27, 1958, when nine brave young Negroes in the parlance of their day integrated the formerly all-white Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. We see the racist threats and taunts they endured and how humor faced solidarity with each other and family and sheer grit helped them through a difficult year. And this was so, this was this incredible civics lesson that really brought it home. You, you saw how this one optimistic, bubbly girl who just totally felt like every, that she could, everything was going to be wonderful and she was going to be a singer and Tammy was her favorite song and she loved Debbie Reynolds and she was everything was going to be great for her and how it crushed her spirit and then you have Stephanie Umo who we just know from Ragtime it just was we had a great cast I love this yeah it's a play with music and you know the 50 songs they used and the gospel songs really got you um, to understand the period and these people. Um, it was a little too preachy and too clean, especially at the beginning for me. But by the second act, it was much more dramatic. And again, it's a very important lesson. And the actors are great. And you really do begin to feel strongly for these characters. So it's definitely worth seeing. Oh yeah, it totally brings it to life, the, the Little Rock Nine, and it's, it's an important thing to know about too. And also, don't, uh, and Emmett Till had just happened. So they had the specter of this 14-year-old that had just been hung for like just looking at a white person. I mean, things were just fraught in the South back then. The whole, you know, separate but equal. You kind yeah, of, it's amazing how vicious you know, these people oh. were. But they're also heroes. We do get to hear from Martin Luther King Jr. And Mike Wallace. And, and Eisenhower. So, you know, some people were really helping out. This is Jan Ewing's review of Symphony Fantastique, which closes this weekend, September 2nd. Twenty years ago, a young puppeteer named Basil Twist worked at the Here Art Center, created a unique visual experience which was quite new for the time. Inspired by a brilliant musical work, he turned a simple tank of water into a mystical playground, creating magical, seemingly live creatures out of everyday objects. Almost single-handedly, he raised puppetry to high art. Since then, his creation, which he called Symphony Fantastique, after the grand work composed by noticed French composer Hector Berlioz in 1830, has been performed to great acclaim all over the world and has now returned to its original venue in New York City with an even bigger fish tank. <laughs> the, when the curtain rises, the audience is transported into an alternative universe resembling an ethereal underwater ballet. Feathers dance in a complicated bas de deux. Strange exotic fish, all puppets created out of long scarves and flashing and fluorescent colors, swim in and out, punctuating the action as the great symphony flows from quiet contemplation to thunderous, earth-shaking climax. 
Every moment of this marvelous presentation offers something new and unexpected. It is truly inspired. How lucky we are to have such artistry available to us in our city. And Mr. Christopher O'Reilly, who plays live piano music through the whole thing, is simply breathtaking. And he gives this a happy face. I took Alfie when he was a baby, and we just, uh, the babies love this. Straight White Men is now on Broadway. It's written by young Jean Lee, directed by Anna D. Shapiro, and it's framed by people outside the straight white male power structure. Straight White Men is an odd Christmas story featuring a family of four straight white men. The 40 ish year old brothers, writer Drew and banker Jake, return to the family house to spend Christmas Eve and day with their father Ed and older brother Matt who is now living there again. Um, it's the brothers horse around a lot in a manner that's more like something teenagers would do. It's intended to be funny, but I found it excruciatingly boring. And I just didn't see the point of this at all. I just felt it was a very uncharitable view by you know a woman who's outside the straight male world presenting men without any women in their lives um, except for um, the mother who seemed to have been a feminist hero and is now dead. Um, and I just was suffering for the whole like 85 minutes. Meanwhile, I had the, I had the opposite effect on me. I just loved it. And the fact that it was written and directed by women to me made this doubly fascinating. Only the people outside looking in, to quote Evan Hansen, can really get a handle on the aberrant and in some cases abhorrent behavior of the species in question. In this case, we are viewing straight white men in their natural habitat of the family room behind a picture frame with fancy gold plating declaring the inhabitants inside this frozen set. Unlike Mark, the audience and I were vastly entertained. Not all of the audience. People that I spoke to hated it, yeah, too. One person, no. The rest of the people we, uh, were, were, were entertained by the antics going on. I see how my son and his friends interact, and this was a true they're representation 20, they're not 40. of what I witnessed. Playing electronic and board games, random wrestling, dancing and singing, and who can annoy each other the most. And boys grow into men who will be men. Some people become mature adults and are more reasonable than the creatures on view here. Well, to me, <laughs> what made this such a great satire was the earnestness in the characters believing that they were sincere, noble adults contributing to a society in a grandiose manner despite the drawbacks of their many privileges of being straight white men. I don't know. To and me, it's, uh, it was political correctness. Um, as boring as it could oh, possibly no, just be. just the opposite. They have this horrible lot of music in the beginning to kind of make you, to disturb you and make you sort of put, you know, put you on the edge of your seat uh, sort of thing. There was a reason for it, but to me it was just bad for my vertigo. That's the only thing that bothered me. And I really hate that theater because it's so uncomfortable. But I thought this play was just, I thought it was brilliant. I don't have anything to compare it to. I've never seen Young Jean King. I love this. And this is a very polarizing play because people either hate this play or love this play. And I happen to be on the loving end. I'm on the hating end. So <laughs> go and see it and judge for yourself. Exactly. One of the glories of 40s Broadway musicals is back in a great new production. Carousel, music by Richard Rogers, book and lyrics by... Oscar Hammerstein II, based on the play Lillian by Ferenc Molnar, as adapted by Benjamin F. Glazer, directed by Jack O'Brien. It's about the um, textile factory girl Julie Jordan, who falls for ne'er-do-well carnival barker Billy Bigelow, while her friend Carrie Pipridge marries the hard-working herring fisherman Enoch Snow. Many people want a piece of handsome Billy including widowed Mrs. Mulligan, who wants Billy to leave his wife to return to service her and her carousel. Villain Jigger wants him to join in killing thievery and gay sailing. This, you know, it's a terrible story because it basically glorifies wife beating, but the music is gorgeous, and they just impacted a fabulous job of choreography with the most with Amar Ramasor as Jigger, who was just incredible. Renee Fleming with her opera 
uh, clam bake and uh, Joshua Henry and Jesse Mueller as uh, the, the leads and Lindsay Menzez and Alexander Gemignani as the uh, minor characters. I'm uh, not minor, but but th it doesn't matter. This is a, just a gorgeous, beautiful, wonderful thing to see despite its problems. And just to remind you, if I loved you, you'll never walk alone and Billy's soliloquy are some of the great songs that are classics from it. You know, it's closing way too early. It should never close. So rush and see it. Remember to check out our written reviews on Facebook. You can, on Twitter, Small Reviews. And on YouTube, Eva Heinemann, you can see the show before Saturday. And this is where all of high drama is right now. It's Salome, Oscar Wilde Salome. Renee Taylor, My Life on a Diet is hysterical. This is where you can catch all the shows that we talked about. And the second man we're going to go see, that's closing September 8th, and that's about astronauts whom I love. Straight White Man closes September 9th, Carousel on the 16th. Do check out Deborah Carpell, September 7th at 7 o'clock at Panagia. And also on Mondays they have these cool movies there. And at the duplex, uh, Stephen Carl McCaslin's Lane Strich Tribute is going to be September 7, 7 o'clock at the duplex called Not at Liberty. And 54 sings Ain't Misbehaving and Golden Rainbow at Feinstein's 54 Below with the original cast. Richard Skipper is back celebrating at Laurie Beachman September 9th at 1 o'clock and he's doing those glorious Warner Brothers black and white films. Agnes of 59 59th Street is supposed to be really good. I can't wait to see that. And John Krasinski's with Stephen Cabal at Col Colbert at 92nd Street Y. There's even more stuff going on at here. And Theater for the New City has a Dream Up Festival. And I'm going to check these out. Le Marquise de Châtelet and the Dragon Griswind. And they're free. Theater of the New City all over the boroughs. Shame or Doomsday Machine. Check that out. The La Mama starts up September 13th with their season. And the Clown Festival's back at the Brick. I hope they're having the pie-finding contest. I love doing that. We're going to be seeing Worse Than Tigers at New Ohio Theater. And the Gospel of the Coralinas is going to be at the Delacourt September 4th through 9th. And Red Emma and the Monk looks really good at the tank. And uh, Hotsy Totsy Burlesque Doctor Who is going on. And uh, I have a review of their last show from Jordan. Eugene O'Neill's Long Voyage Home is going on, South Street Street for free, September 5th through 9th. Feathers of Fire is a Persian epic, which we're going to go see September 7th and 8th. And Rip Van Winkle has Adam Auslander in it, and that's going on. And John Cleese's Bang Bang is going on in Ellenville. And some theater we'll talk about on our next show, September 15th. And go check them out. We have closed shows on our Facebook, parody production reviews. Pick up your performing arts inside of the cultural heartbeat of New York City. Next show. And it's been a year since Barry Lehman died on September 1st, and we still miss him horribly.